started streaming. What's up, everyone? I'm back from New York. Went there and interviewed John Schofield, which will be out maybe on Monday, depending on when I get edited. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Those of you that don't know John Schofield, he's a legend in our time. One of my favorite guitar players. Um, okay, discount code for today is the... Uh, there is no discount code. Go to beattlebundle.com. This is our annual sale that we do in April, the annual mega sale. All my products, Beato Book Bundle, 700 page PDF, my ear training course, and my uh, Quick Lessons Pro and the, and the um, 90 PDF bundle, all together for 99 bucks, which is saving, the, like all those things together, I think are 430 bucks. So it's a huge savings on that, $330 savings on it if you were to buy them all separately. So if you only have a couple of these and you want to complete the thing, this is the time to do it. Also helps support the channel too and teaches you music. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk music theory here. I haven't done a live stream on, with Whiteboard in a while. Uh, I just did a guitar video on, on two solos that were very important in my development, and I'm gonna talk about theory in relation to, to just basic music theory for anybody, but I'm also gonna talk about things that I talked about in that um, in that video where I talked about the Hey Joe solo and the Kid Charlemagne solo. Hey Joe from Jimi Hendrix, Kid Charlemagne from Larry Carlton's solo from Steely Dan. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the pentatonic theories and things like that. So it's gonna be practical stuff, it's gonna be Basic stuff to more advanced stuff all together. I'm going to do a semester of music theory in one hour. We've started the clock already. I'm going to start with chord construction. I'm not going to start with a circle of fifths or anything like that. This is uh, That stuff gets too dry. Uh, that's all in my book. You can read about it. It's in the first chapter of Learn, Learn My Keys, but I'm going to take it a little different approach. Talk about triad construction. Talk about uh, seventh chords, upper structures, things like that. I'm going to talk about pentatonic scales. So let's start here with chord construction. Okay, so uh, we're going to take a basic major chord. Major, minor, diminished, augmented. Those are your four basic chords, the way that you... Uh, um, uh, the, the, these are the things that are commonly found in keys, although... In major keys, you don't find augmented chords, but you'll find them in Beatles songs, and you'll find them in Steely Dan, you'll find them in Led Zeppelin. Okay, major, one, three, five. Minor, one, flat, three, five. These are just basic formulas that you memorize. Diminished, one, flat, three, flat, five. Augmented, one, three, sharp, five, okay? I always like to, to say that the, the augmented and major are related because they both have a major third, so if we... Um, Let's say I take a C major uh, chord. Okay, so this is a C major chord, C, E, G. Let me turn off my, my keyboard pad here so that it doesn't uh, confuse you guys. So the um, C to E is a major third, and then up to that G is, a, uh, is the fifth. So it's one, three, five, right? The outer intervals are a perfect fifth here. Now to get an augmented chord, I take that fifth of the chord, right, the top note of the chord, move it up a half step, becomes an augmented chord. If I take the ma major chord and I flat the third, so take the middle note of the chord, move it down a half step, it becomes minor. So I just went from C major to C minor, right? If I lower the fifth now to the flat fifth, everything good, Billy? That minor chord, if you lower the flat fifth, it becomes a diminished chord. So diminished chord formula is one, flat three, flat five. You have to just memorize these. Pretty easy to remember, okay? I'm gonna talk about other types of chords next, but I wanna talk about a formula that I learned in my first guitar lesson from Tom Rizzo back in the late 70s. And Tom said, in a major key, the one, four, and five are major chords, right? The two chord, three chord, and six chord are minor chords. That's why I'm writing these, these are lowercase Roman numerals that indicate minor. Those are minor chords, 
So they're built on those scale degrees. And the, and the chord built on the seventh scale degree has its circle. That is a diminished, right? This kind of a chord right here, okay? So essentially, what you have to do is you have to actually understand what notes are in each key, but we'll just take the key of C major for now, just all the white notes on the piano. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Those are your seven scale degrees. So on the first scale degree is a major chord, so C major. The second scale degree is minor. The third scale degree is minor. The fourth scale degree is major. That's F major. Fifth scale degree is major. That's G major. Sixth scale degree is minor. And the seventh scale degree is diminished. And then it resolves back up to the tonic chord again on C major. This is the formula for major keys. So if you know what notes are in the key, in the key of C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, right? It's all white notes here. And then you plug in the formulas. Two, three, and six are minor. I just use a minus for minor. So this is your one chord. So C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, and then E diminished. When you talk about a blues, a blues is one, four, five. If I'm in, if I'm just doing a C blues, it's C, F, and G are the only three chords in it, okay? If I'm jamming on it. Um, now, if you are playing modern pop music or, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be, it could be jazz, it could be pop music, it could be anything, it doesn't have to be modern, it just historically, you have things like suspended chords. Where is, what are suspended chords? Where do they fall in? Well, they have formulas too. You have the sus2. That's really a common one. You have that sus2. And sus4. You hear those kind of things all the time. If you listen to James Taylor, Led Zeppelin, it's in everything. Billie Eilish, whoever, everybody uses these chords, right? These sus chords. Sus2, sus4. The formulas are this, sus2 is one, two, five, sus4 is one, four, five, okay? If I take the notes of C major, these I, I put the chords of C major, but these are also the notes of C major. So you'd go one, two, five, so sus2 is the notes C, D, G, right? And then sus4 is one, four, five, the first note of the scale, the fourth note of the scale, the fifth note of the scale. So one, two, fives, that's sus2, one, four, five is sus4, okay? There's also other triads that I use that I've been teaching for 35 years or so that are in my Beato book. They're in my ear training course, which you can get all of these for 99 bucks and save yourself $330. Like I said, if you own one of these things, this is the time to get everything, right? This will, all this stuff is in there and it teaches you how to hear them. So the things that I teach that you will not find in any books, um, I don't know why. It's weird. Like I've been teaching this stuff for so long. I've been teaching it on my channel, and I still don't see anybody use these terms. I don't know why, but they should. They will eventually. One, sharp four and five is a Lydian triad. I use this the uh, Phrygian triad. One, flat two, five. It comes from the Phrygian mode. And... Um, these two triads, there's other ones, but these are really common ones. So the Lydian, one sharp four five, so that would be C, F sharp, G. C, F sharp, G, that's a Lydian triad. Okay, the Phrygian triad would be like from C Phrygian, so one flat two five. Think of it like these are kind of, these are like susses, right? But they're susses with a flat, two. it's like a sus two with a flat two. And this is like a, a sus4 with a sharp4, sus sharp4, you can think of it in that way, okay? What are these chords good for? These chords are really good for playing cool chord voicings. I like to use these things when I'm improvising. I use these little fragments here, like uh, I can play a C, a C Lydian triad like that, and it sounds really dark. Right? and bright at the same time. Very weird, dark and bright. If I play it, if I use that sharp four there, I've used the C major chord. The C lady is just those four, those three notes. That's a beautiful sound, but if I put A in the bass, A, 
um, if I put A in the bass, it gives you like a Dorian sound, right? You can put a G in the bass, it gives you a, um, would be like a inverted, um, this is like a G, part of a G major 7 sus4 sound. These are kind of incomplete chords though, right? But these little fragments, these these triads that are that are unusual, I like to use, and you should be able to identify these things. Um, and uh, the formulas here, once again, you just memorize. Okay, once you know these things, then you put sevenths on them. And there's two basic types of sevenths. You get a major seventh and a minor seventh, or a major seventh and a flat seventh, or just the seven key of C, the 7 would be B, that would be a major 7, and B flat would be the flat 7, right? So, so if I go here and I do a major chord with a 7, that becomes a major 7 chord, okay? Now, there's another chord in here that, that I would space in here, the dominant 7 chord. That would be 1, 3, 5, flat 7, okay? So here's C major seven, and this would be da, 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 would be a dominant seventh. Okay, that's a C seven chord. When you say dominant seventh, you just mean a regular seventh chord. Um, if you take a minor chord and you add a um, a seventh on it, that would be a minor major seven. Right? C minor seven. That's, so this is C minor major seven. And then if I go, so I'm gonna go minor major seven. And then you have C minor seven. One, flat three, five, flat seven. Like I said, this is all in my book. So what you notice here is I'm taking the seven, I go to the flat seven, seven, flat seven. The diminished seven, you can have a diminished major seven. These start to get into more advanced sounding chords. Uh, there's an augmented major seventh. There's an augmented with the uh, a dominant seventh, augmented major seventh. That's a great sound. Now that chord right there, you typically would find in jazz or modern classical music or film scoring. But that particular chord, for example, if I were to take the second chord of Stairway to Heaven, Okay, that chord, right, is this major seven. I'm, I'm going to get demonetized for this. I'm not going to get demonetized. I'm just going to play the one chord, okay? But I may get demonetized, but we'll see. So if I take this chord right here, you get G sharp, C, E, B, okay? So I'm gonna erase some of this stuff here so it's clearer and explain what that chord is. If I take a C major seven chord, C major seven, one, three, five, seven, but I raise that fifth, we call it C major seven sharp five. So I have the C, E, G sharp, B. This is a C augmented triad. The plus means augmented. Okay, so check this out. If I just invert the notes and I start on this note and I go G sharp, B, C, E, what do I have? I have the same chord, G sharp, C, E, B. So the second chord in Stairway to Heaven is just a second inversion, major seven sharp five chord. So you've actually hear this stuff. You don't realize that you've heard these chords a million times in pop music. It's in something. It's in every song in the 70s and the 60s. I mean, the Beatles used it all the time. Michelle, it's in, it's in everything, right? These major seven sharp fives, you're like, oh, I would never use that chord. You've actually used it, but you use it in inversion all the time because it's always part of... <laughs> You hear in these line cliches like that, but that second, that chord, that particular chord there is a major seven sharp five in second inversion. What do I mean by second inversion? 
Let's just talk about this real quick here because I want to talk about seventh chords. Inversions is something you learn in right inversions. I'm a very bad speller, but I know how to spell beatobundle.com. <laughs> if you go here, this is our annual April mega sale, spring mega sale, 99 bucks off or $99 for all of my products. Beato book, ear training, quick lessons pro and for the 90 PDF bundle. Um, let's see, so inversions. If I take a C major chord, C, E, G, one, three, five, that's, that's because the root note of the chord is in the bass, so if I start on the third, I go E, G, C, it's three, five, one. This is a first inversion chord. First inversion. And if I put G in the bass, fifth, it doesn't matter what the order of the, uh, uh, of the other two notes, five, one, three. As long as the five is in the bass, if I have this G in the bass, doesn't matter it's always going to be a second inversion chord right so we call this a second inversion chord first inversion has the third in the bass second inversion chord has the fifth of the chord in the bass okay these are that's how inversions work very very simple what well, you'd be like well, why do you use inversions use inversions so you have cool bass motion so your chord progressions aren't just boring all the time. Like I, I will use inversions. Um, if any of you guys ever watch my, um, any of my uh, shorts on here, or if you go to, um, to Instagram, watch my stuff on Instagram, you'll hear me play things like, uh, like a, uh, that would be a C minor spread triad, right? This is a uh, first inversion F major chord. Root position, B flat. First inversion, E flat. So. Those kind of things sound really cool, those inversions, right? I could go... position chords not really as interesting right you, listen this is root position this is if I invert the chords root position first inversion so root position C minor first inversion F major so it's got the third in the bass A root position B flat first inversion E flat root position A diminished first inversion major root position G minor, right?
playing. They're great for chording. It makes your playing and your compositions more interesting because the bass motion or the line motion sounds way, way more interesting, right? Somebody said it sounds like rain. It does kind of sound like rain, right? Somebody said Grandpa Gibson. What does that mean? Grandpa Gibson. Is that me? I kind of like that, Grandpa Gibson. Um, so, so these are inversions, right? Let's talk about seventh chords, okay? So, um, talked about Hey Joe this week in my in my uh, uh, video on the two solos that influenced me the most. And the main chord in Hey Joe that Jimi Hendrix like to use is E7 sharp nine. Let's talk about this chord for a minute. E7 is E, G sharp, B, D. Okay, this is one, three, five, flat seven. This is E7, and then the sharp nine, okay, is the note. Uh, it's really the note G, if you think of this chord like this. But really, if you think, okay, what is the ninth? The ninth is 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 F is uh, F sharp in that key. It'd be like F double sharp. We don't want to talk about. It. We'll just say it's G here, it's just for sake of ease. G is the sharp nine. Okay. So you notice it has a third and it has a sharp nine, right? So this chord here, I actually am leaving out the D of the chord. It's or, or I'm sorry, leaving out the B. It's unneeded here. You only have so many strings. You can play the thing on the piano too and include all the notes. So I can go E. Uh, sorry. I can, uh, let me go back to my piano sound here because it's kind of weird. Uh, I have to turn this up here. It's confusing to me. There's my E7 chord. Let me do it in this register. So, I'm sorry. That's E7, right? And if I add the sharp nine on the top. If I take that B out, it sounds more like the chord. Right, that's the Hendrix chord right there, okay? So in the lesson, I talked about Jimi Hendrix uses that E minor pentatonic over that. It's like, well, why does that work? Why does it give it that bluesy sound? Well, let's check it out here. So if I play this voicing right here, whoops. third in there but for a blues playing you pretty much skip that major third you might you might bend into it a little bit if, if I have that chord again let me play again sharp nine on there, right? That E7 sharp nine thing. So these are altered dominant chords. They have alterations on them. The alterations, typically uh, when you have a chord, I'll, I'm going to use C again because it's easier for you to, to uh, understand. I'll take a C7 chord. So C, E, G, B flat. This is a C7 chord. One, three, five, flat, seven. Okay. Okay. So the altered notes that you have when you're talking about seventh chords, you have flat nines, sharp nines, flat fives, and sharp fives. Those are, the, those are your alterations, okay? Um, people will be like, well, what about the sixth? You know, can't you have a flat six? Well, the sharp five is a flat six, right? So, so it's same thing, although, although it has a different function. 
like mixolydian flat six has a natural fifth and a flat six. We'll talk about that in a minute here. But your typical um, uh, things would be your flat nine, flat nine, sharp nine, flat five, sharp five. Okay, your flat nine is gonna be the note D flat, okay? So if I take um, C7, there's my natural nine, that would be C9. I'm gonna actually put these things in here. So D is the nine, F is the 11, and A is the 13, okay? So a, a C13 chord has the note A in there. So typically on guitar, you voice it like this, C, C, B flat, E, A. That's a 13 shape on guitar. So you actually leave some notes out. You're not gonna play all of these notes in here. Typically 13th chords will have the root, the flat seven, the third, and the 13th. So you have to give up some of the notes, but that gives you the sound of a 13th chord. But really that note, Right there, that note A is the... Love that sound. Great, great sound, right? Uh, the ninth, C9. You guys know that chord. That's a really common, common chord right there. that ninth to the C7. I love that. Or did I play a C7 chord? Here. Um, uh, I'll just play a straight C7 here. I use a C9 arpeggio. I'll just play the root. That's a C9 sound, right? This is the 11th F. Now, the alterations here just give you different colors. C7 flat 9 would sound like this, C7 sharp nine, C7 flat five, would be that, C7 sharp five would be that. Those chords are used in rock music, they're used in, but they're used in jazz more. This would be D sharp, would be the sharp nine, the flat five, take the fifth, so it'd be G flat, and the sharp five is G sharp, right? Makes sense, you take the fifth, if you flat it, you just move it down a half step, right? So G goes to G flat, and the sharp fifth moves up a half step, so G goes to G sharp. These are how you get these different chords. These are your extended dominant chords, okay? And these are in all different types of music. You'll find these chords. You don't find them in pop music as much anymore, but you'll find them in Bruno Mars songs. Like Keep the Door Open has dominant seven flat nines, has augmented dominant chords, things like that. Major seventh chords. You will find those chords all over that. Typically on that record, anytime people are doing retro sounding stuff, they're using these chords. If they're borrowing stuff from the 70s, like from Earth, Wind, and Fire, or groups like that, you're going to have those, um, you're going to have those, those types of sounds. Once again, all this stuff is in my Beato book bundle, or my Beato bundle. If you go to BeatoBundle.com, you can find this. You get my Beato book, you'll get my ear training course, you get my Quick Lessons Pro Guitar course, and you get 90 PDF, uh, 90 PDFs. This is a $390 savings, all for 99 bucks. So like I said earlier, if you only have my Beato book and you wanna get my ear training, you're like, eh, I think I might get Rick's ear training course. This is the time to do that, right? This has all these things. Because it teaches you how to hear them. It's one thing to, for me to say, 
That's a C13 chord. It's another thing to be able to hear it and you go, that's a 13 chord. Or if I hit, you say this, that's a C7, that's a G7 sharp five chord. You may not know it's a G7 sharp five chord, you just know it's a dominant seven sharp five chord, right? Or if I have this chord, you may say, well, that's Jimi Hendrix chord. Well, Jimi Hendrix chord is a dominant seven sharp nine chord. Doesn't matter where it's played. Okay. Great sounds. These are uh, ways to make your playing more colorful. Okay. So I can take these same dominant sounds though, all right? Those are those are give you some altered sounds. Uh, you can also have things like extended major seventh chords, right? C major seven. C, E, G, B, one, three, five, seven. Then I have the D, F, A, but maybe I have D, F sharp, A, so this would be nine, sharp, 11, 13. Uh, now these chords are really cool. If you listen to um, Steve Vai, people like that, you'll hear these, these Lydian chords. So this Lydian sound that I'm playing here, right? Check it out, listen. sharp 11 or that sharp 4, right? If it's down in a low register, when I talk about that Lydian triad, that's what I mean. 1 sharp 4, 5, 1 sharp 4, 5. If I could put A in the base of it, it gives you a cool sound. because I want to talk about pentatonics because pentatonics are used all the time. Most pop melodies that you hear on the radio are pentatonic melodies. What is a pentatonic scale? Pentatonic scale, pentatonic just means a five note scale, but typically you're talking about two different types of scales, major and minor pentatonic. Let's talk about minor pentatonics first. Let's say a minor pentatonic. Pent means five, right? So that, that would be the notes A, C, D, E, G. Or one, flat three, four, five, flat seven. This is a minor pentatonic scale. Okay, so if I'm looking here, if you guys know the guitar at all, A minor pentatonic is here. <laughs> extra flat five added a ninth in there too that's just a regular pentatonic nothing added one flat three four five flat seven these are great for improvising they're um as i said in this larry carlton thing though like larry carlton 
superimposes or uses different pentatonics over chords. Like the first chord in Kid Charlemagne is really D minor. Let's say D minor seven. Okay, so he uses A minor pentatonic on that. And he uses D minor pentatonic. Here's D minor pentatonic. Here's A minor pentatonic. practice those two pentatonic scales together because they're really great on minor chords. You take the pentatonic off the tonic. So like if I take a D minor, uh, I take D minor pentatonic. And I take the pentatonic built on the fifth of the chord. The fifth of the chord is A and take the minor pentatonic on that. Now all of this stuff all of these different concepts are in my Beato book. All the theory of these things, right? Of how to, to superimpose these different pentatonic scales. All the stuff that Larry was doing in the solo. Another thing that he was doing is he was using um, minor pentatonics over major chords. So, so like on... Um, uh, on... On, on F major pentatonic, or F, I'm sorry, on F major seven, so, let me see here. He's using A minor pentatonic. I don't want to play it too, too much because it'll get demonetized. But this A minor pentatonic over F major 7 is a great s s modern sound, right? These are called superimposing pentatonics, right? Let's talk about major pentatonics, so though. Every minor pentatonic is a major pentatonic. This is just this simple relative major, relative minor thing, which I'm going to explain. Let's say you have a C major chord, right? C major, uh, the key of C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Take this chord scale, this is C major. It's relative minor, A minor, okay? Uses all the same notes of C major, but it just starts in A. So I'm going to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. C, D, E, F, G. Relative major, minor. They have all the same notes in the scale. They just start in a different place, okay? C major pentatonic and A minor pentatonic are the same scales. They have the same notes. They just start in a different place, right? C major pentatonic is are the notes C D E G A. A minor pentatonic just starts in A. A C D E G. Same notes. So if you know one pentatonic, like A minor pentatonic, you know two pentatonics because it works on on the C. If I start on the note C, the same notes. Or I can start on A. It's the same, all the same notes. But that can't, same scale works on F over F. La 
love that sound. Um, knowing these pentatonics, though, and how to use them in different ways is uh, a great thing to uh, make your playing more interesting. And the way that Larry Carlton is using it in... In, um, and if you haven't watched my video, it's the last video I did. It's the two most important solos. I talked about Hey Joe, which taught me all the basic blues licks, like every important every important blues lick is in that solo. All those things. Are, all those things are in that one solo. So literally the first guitar solo I ever learned uh, was, had so many of the nuances that you need to have when you're playing blues and playing rock. And, uh, and then the Larry Carlton solo is the case study in how to use the right notes over the right chords, especially when you have really complex chord progressions. Because they even have things, they have chords like... <laughs> Chords like that, like E minor seven to D over to E minor, and he goes. Uh, he uses these different scales depending when the chords change. He just changes chord scales. He just knows the chord scales so well that he can play whatever he wants over them. He doesn't make any mistakes, and that's really where you want to be. Is that you want to be to the point where you just have these things under your fingers and under your hands as you're writing, as you're uh, composing, everything like that. Just like I was saying with the inversions. It's like, um, well, how do you practice inversions, right? How do you even learn about inversions? You just, if you're gonna practice on the guitar, when I would practice my inversions, if I'm playing a C major, um, C major triad. That's a root position chord. First inversion. Second inversion. I love these. Uh, root position. First inversion. Second inversion. Root position. First inversion. Second inversion. And they really are cool. Uh, I did a video on, on Instagram that got like a million views and it was, uh, I took a, a um, I took a, I think it was a major seven. No, I think I took a minor chord. I took an A minor seven. The a minor seven chord. And I played A minor triad and then C major, E minor. Major. So if you take those four different triads, A minor, C major, E minor, G major, those all come from the key of A minor. They sound cool together. Well, it's like, okay, well, if A minor and C major work, then all the inversions of C major are going to work on that A minor chord too, right? And all the inversions of, of E minor are going to work. I just love them. Of G major. Versions of those four chords: A minor chord, uh, uh, A minor, second inversion. I'm sorry, A minor, first root position, first inversion, second inversion. Back to the root position. These are things that you have to just get under your fingers. So those are the four verses. These are all in my Beato book, right? They're all in my ear training course. Like, how do you hear these things? Like, how, well, how do you know when a chord's an inversion? You just recognize the sound of the inversions, right? You just recognize, like, that sounds like a, you hear this chord like this. 
when I hear that, I'm like, oh, that's a first inversion major chord. I just know it is. Or, first inversion major chord, right? That means that the third is in the bass. Once again, I call this your, um, uh, uh, your, your vocabulary of recognized sounds, okay? We just know the sound of it. You know, the, the, uh, when I hear this chord, uh, which is like a second inversion major chord, maybe a second inversion F major chord, when I hear that, I think of like Phil Collins or a lot, a lot of stuff, or uh, Steve Winwood. Those guys would use a lot of these second inversion major chords like that. Or you can think. dominant chords, right? Any, any type of chord can be inverted. It doesn't matter. So if I take a C7 chord, C, E, G, B flat, uh, 1, 3, 5, flat 7, right? First inversion is just going to be E, G, B flat, C, okay? So it's got the third in the bass, fifth, flat 7, root. Second inversion starts on G, so G, B flat, C, E, Okay, so that would be um, the fifth, flat seven, root third. And then your uh, third inversion, right? You have three inversions because it's a four note chord. B flat, C, E, G. So that's flat seven, one, three, five. Okay. Um, I had another video on Instagram where I talked about the same thing and talked about practicing the arpeggios um, like uh, C major. Um, what did I do? No. Yeah, that's what I did. So I did C, I did E diminished, and then. G minor, B flat major. That sounds really cool. If I'm playing a C C dominant sound. things I, these are part of my quick lessons thing I go over these th uh, over these things how to practice them they're in my Beato book they're in the ear training course um, how to learn how to hear these how to play them on your instruments whether it's the piano whether it's the guitar whether it's your saxophone whatever it is it's it's um, uh, getting these things under your fingers that's really the key this is like a lifelong pursuit though right you can start out a lot of the stuff is just very basic things hearing a major chord recognizing that it's a major chord hearing a minor chord recognizing a minor chord or a diminished chord or an augmented chord or a sus4 chord then the next step is actually playing them getting them under your fingers how do you play them or recognizing inversions by ear like, okay, this is a, a minor chord in, for, in root, uh, root position to a major chord in first inversion. This would be a major chord in first inversion. I'm, I'm major chord in position. This is a major chord in second inversion. So 
I just know from hearing them because I've done it for so long. This stuff is very easy to learn, though. But it takes practice. It does. Learning all this stuff takes practice. Nothing is easy. When I was talking to John Schofield, it's it's amazing because um, he said so many of the same things that Pat Metheny said, that Al Miola said, that all these great, great players say is how hard they worked to get really good on their instruments, that they started out not knowing anything. And they just learned this stuff by practicing. And John Schofield's going to be 71 this year, and he was practicing all the time. We talked about it. It's like, what are you working on? Oh, man, I'm practicing my alternate picking. It's like, what? He's 70 years old. He's trying to get, I'm trying to get better on my alternate picking. I'm trying to pick slanting. He goes to YouTube looks at videos and stuff, you know? He was telling me, he was like, uh, he goes, I loved your video on the string gauges when I when I did this video with Rhett and Dave where we did uh, uh, talking about lighter gauge strings have a, tighten up your sound, right? So if um, we took 11s, 10s, 9s, and 8s and recorded them playing the same thing and then put them back to back. And as you went to lighter strings, the amp sound tightened up and sounded better. And he said it was such a fascinating thing because it goes... It's just the opposite of what you think. But these things are always, these are things that you just experiment with and you learn over time. I learn these things just like I learned inversions by uh, recognizing it's like, God, these guys, I'm playing, doing all these metal bands, all these, they're tuned down to B, tuned down to B flat. And the amp is really muddy. So if I cut some of the low end off the, before it goes into the amp, by putting a, um, like an EQ pedal, just ducking some of the low end on it, all of a sudden, the sound tightens up. And I was being interviewed by Dave Friedman, who's a great amp builder, uh, and he, we talked about this. And then I interviewed him for my channel, and he said, you know, heavier strings have more bass, and so lighter strings have less bass, and they sound tighter. You should make that video. That's where I got the idea. I was like, that's a great idea. He said, it's exactly what you're saying about the... Uh, Taking the low end off the guitar when you're playing with a distorted sound uh, uh, tightens up the sound, but you should actually do the video to prove that or to demonstrate it, okay? These are all the same kind of principles. It's just, you just expose yourself to all these things and just memorize what they sound like, right? Memorize how to use them. You memorize the formulas. There is no magic here when I'm, when I'm telling you, when I write this stuff out, um, you know, what is a major chord, right? One, three, five, minor, one flat, three, five, diminish, one flat, three, flat, five, augmented, one, three, sharp, five, sus, four, one, four, five, sus, two, one, two, five. These are just formulas I learned 40 years ago. They never change. So once you learn them once, if you have a good memory, then you can use these things for the rest of your life. And this is what is so great about this stuff is that music theory doesn't ever change. Once you learn it and you put some practice in behind it, you got it. You got it. And I always tell people, it's like, you know, if you really worked at it hard, you could learn all of music theory probably in about two and a half to three years or so. And I'm talking about all classical music theory, learning more esoteric things, and they're not really esoteric, but like augmented six chords, German six, Italian six, six chords, French six chords, Neapolitan six chords. These are things that, that they used, you know, back in the Romantic era that they don't really use. I mean, some people use them. I used them in an Instagram post recently. I did a a, uh, a thing using the Neapolitan six chord and explaining what it was. But but um, Ingve would use something like this. But these concepts, all these concepts that you learn, you learn term, term, uh, terms like tonic, supertonic, median. These are these are called scale degree names. These are things that you would learn in your first semester of music theory, right? The chord built on the uh, so you get if we're in the key of C, C, D minor, E minor, F major, G, A minor, E diminished. This is your tonic chord. This is your uh, supertonic. This is your median chord. 
This is your subdominant chord. Um, this is your dominant chord. This is your submediant chord. Sorry about my writing, and this is your leading tone chord. Oh, this hurts my arm to write this. These names are things that people, if, I, if you're talking about learning all of classical music theory uh, in your first semester, or whatever, these are the things that you would learn. These are part of classical music theory. Do you need to know these things? Well, if you're just talking to, to, uh, to a musician, you're trying to describe a thing, oh, it goes to the dominant chord. Well, if you know what the dominant is, you know it's the chord built on the fifth scale degree. In the key of C, it's the chord G major, right? Or it's a subdominant, or the supertonic is D minor, right? Mediant. Mediant is halfway between the tonic and the dominant is the mediant chord, right? And the submediant is built on the sixth chord, right? So these are just, once again, this is just stuff to memorize. Do you need it? You only need it if people start throwing around terms and you're like, what are they? Why does we keep using this thing tonic or this, this term dominant or subdominant or leading tone? What does that even mean? These are just names given to the scale degrees in, in keys, right? Uh, it's just, music theory is just a way to talk about music and explain things to people using language without demonstrating, okay? But to me, demonstrating is far better. It's far better to learn the stuff by ear. I didn't know what Larry Carlton did. I had to figure it out first and then understand, I'm like, okay, where is that scale when he's playing this F major seven chord? Why is he using these notes? And I was like, those are the notes of A minor pentatonic. Why is he using A minor pentatonic on F major? I don't know, but it sounds great. But then I look at this F major seven chord and I see that there's an A minor chord right in an F major seven chord. F major seven is really A minor with an F in the bass. So if I play, an A minor arpeggio, I use A minor, uh, A minor add nine. Uh, so that's, that's just something I learned right off the bat. It's just like finding these, like, why is he doing that? And I said, well, he's doing that because it sounds great. So these added note chords, this is another thing that you learn that are common in music. If you say C add nine, that means C major, C, E, G. So one, three, five. Add nine means adding the ninth or the second. Second and the ninth are the same thing. The reason that it's the ninth, if you take a C major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, and you count the notes, one, two, three, four, sorry, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That D is nine notes from the root. So this could also be C add two. So if you play this chord on the guitar like this, this is a C add nine chord on guitar. This note D is the add nine. Why is it add nine? Because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Because it's nine notes above the root of the chord. Okay, that's where these add nine chords are. So you can have major add nines, you can have minor add nines, a C minor add nine, uh, C minor, minus means minor, that would just be an E flat there. That'd be a C minor add nine. So you take C minor chord, one, three, five, and you just put the ninth in there or the second. Uh, C minor, add two, same thing, right? So these are uh, uh, these are sounds that are very commonly used. Minor nines, major add nines, minor add nines. You can have an add four. I love this. C major, it's one of my favorite ones here. Add fours, I use them all the time. C major, add four. C, E, F, G. One, three, four, five. 
Um, that sound, if I'm playing... sounds you can use them all the time you, you you recognize them it's used in popular music it's used in jazz it's used in everything it's used in funk it's used in everything it's ad force i uh, did this breakdown of uh of i'm the walrus when i did my live show up in new york and there's one spot where john lennon plays this this ad four chord and he probably didn't know what it was called or anything he just knew it sounded good thing is that he knew enough to play it and and when um, George Martin was writing the string arrangement to it the orchestral arrangement he made sure to to make that sound happen in the orchestration because John played it on purpose it's a great great sound I lo love that tune uh, I think I have one super chat here thank you here for uh, Bubba by the bundle, I'm an old jazz professor. No skin in the game other than use it my, from time to time. Only well, I start at the beginning. Don't skip around for Grandpa Gibson presents material in a specific order. Building blocks, Grandpa Gibson. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. Appreciate the plug. BeattleBundle.com, annual mega sale that I do in April. It's my birthday month. I'm going to be 60 in two weeks. 60. 99 bucks is $330 off normal if you bought everything. So I uh, appreciate all of you sticking with this. Um, if you want to know more about music theory, that's where to start. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks for everybody sticking with this. I know this this is really uh, gets to be a uh, like drinking out of a fire hose, but you get it. Just got to practice it. You guys are the best. Thanks.